Um, and I'm now going to welcome Andrew back on to the stage for the first of our um, of our conversations. So um, we're going to have a panel. Sorry, we just uh, I'm a paper. I'm still stuck with paper. Um, we're going to have a conversation about four perspectives uh, on culture as a pillar for climate action. So I'd like to welcome Andrew Potts to the stage, um, Fahana Yamin, long time uh, collaborator, supporter, and culture cop um, founder, Her Royal Highness Princess Diana Firas, president. Um, I, actually, I'll leave you to introduce some of these people, but also Sunshine Dunstan Moore. Uh, can you join us too? Great. And uh, Dr. Asama Abdel Migud, thank you so much. Thank you, Alison. I, I have to say I'm struck by the parallels between the remarks that Reem Abdul gave us and the remarks Dr. Othman gave us. And I'm struck by the diversity of ways that culture voices contribute, um, and also the similarities and also the differences. So that was remarkable to me to, to consider this. Well, we're going to try to channel that energy uh, and that passion that you just heard about and refract it from here five kilometers down the road to the blue zone and, and think about how these ideas and these voices then intersect with climate planning, climate policy, climate science, climate action. The, as Allison said, this panel is meant to be a conversation where we ask four disparate voices to share their perspectives on the intersection between culture and tackling the climate crisis. And this panel takes as its point of departure uh, an extraordinary remark made by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, a few days ago where he said that climate action is, do you know what he said a few days ago? Failing. That was his word, failing. And it was extraordinary and surprising, and no less so, even though he had actually made the same observation a few months ago. This is the second time he said the word failing. A few months ago, he said that the most recent assessment of the state of the climate was, and I'm quoting, a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. That's what he said, damning indictment of failed climate leadership. So uh, remarkably, this year is also the 30th anniversary of the Rio conference, the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, where the United Nations Climate Agency, the UNFCCC, was launched and where the countries of the world agreed to make tackling greenhouse gas emissions a global shared goal. So 30 years later, literally almost to the day, the launch of the UN Climate Agency, Secretary General Guterres says we failed. So that's remarkable, don't you think? And it leaves us to wonder, failed why? Failed how? I mean, this got to be a question on everybody's mind. And there is increasingly a critique from not me, not artists, not conservators, from climate scientists who say that climate planning and policy has failed because it has omitted the cultural and social dimension, because it hasn't endeavored to help people imagine and realize what a post-carbon, just, climate-resilient future might look like, because it has excluded too many people from the conversation, because it has centered the voices of people who represent the very institutions that gave us anthropogenic climate change and not the voices that have been critiquing that take, make, waste philosophy from the beginning. And so how do we correct a failing climate planacy, planning and policy? Well, maybe culture. Maybe culture, the missing pillar, is part of the answer. And so that's really the brief for this panel. You can ask the four colleagues that you've heard from what their perspective is on this question. If, as Secretary General Guterres says, climate planning and policy is failing, then how does culture intersect with that as part of the problem, as part of the solution, as a missing pillar? And so uh, uh, Allison has already introduced you to the panelists. I'll 
Um, I think leave it at that, uh, but um, thank each of them again in the interest of time and get right into the heart of it uh, and uh, ask each of our panelists if they would um, just reflect briefly, four or five minutes on these questions, and then we'll go into more of a round table approach and hopefully have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So my question, dear, dear panelists, is uh, what is your reaction to this observation that current climate planning is failing? And how do you see culture intersecting with that? What is the role of culture in the failure, in getting out of the failure? How do culture and climate intersect? Um, and uh, uh, maybe I'll take the panels. This is happening uh, in real time. I haven't briefed them on this, but maybe I'll take the panels in the order that I see them and ask uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Dana Faras, who is a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, uh, the president of the Petra National Trust in Jordan, and also the co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network Culture at COP Working Group, ask uh, Princess Dana if she would uh, take the lead and uh, 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 answer first this question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you all for being here. It is a pleasure for me to be here um, in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt and in this beautiful museum um, and to be part of this very important day. OK. So I've been thinking a lot about the question that you have raised. And I do agree with the assessment that culture is most definitely the missing component in more successful climate action. And I think the prayer that we just heard could perhaps be um, a very powerful illustration of why that is so. As we are all touched very deeply in ways that we possibly cannot verbalize or even understand by, um, by what we have just heard, um, this is what culture does. It touches us in ways that move us, that motivate us, that mobilize us. And for climate action to be effective, we need transformative change. We have to change the, in our entire understanding of um, consumption, of production, of lifestyles. And we cannot do that if there is not a deep conviction um, about that. And that's where, that's where culture is important. It, it really motivates us on a very spiritual level to, to make changes that could possibly be uncomfortable and difficult, but we know are essential for the future that, that um, we are all hoping for. I, I thought about, you know, culture really works as the, so as we think about our goals, climate action goals, and these enormous uh, uh, sort of overarching uh, goals that, that have been set for us. How do we take that and translate it into action on the ground that involves people, that includes the perspectives of different people, the priorities of different people at all levels of society? We do that through culture. We Culture gives us the space. Um, to really engage voices from throughout our community, to affirm voices, beliefs, and diversity from throughout our communities, and to bring those voices to the table in very meaningful ways on the ground at, at, um, at levels where action is possible and where action can be meaningful. And this, in very practical terms, is what culture does um, to help bridge the gap between large goals and, and action on the ground. Um, Andrew spoke about this. Culture is, is imagination. Culture enables us to see the future that we all want to see. That we have to imagine where we want to go before we can manifest it, before we can realize it. And I think the ability of culture to, to really expand our creative consciousness, our ability to see beyond what, what is um, presented to us is, is how we can um, engage with, with culture more meaningfully. Um, culture gives voice to ancient, traditional, inherited knowledge, know-how, um, uh, technology that, that has so far been excluded from 
solutions from negotiations and and for that and culture enables us to bring that back on an equal footing to sort of more traditional technological approaches and and these technologies are what's important um mr waziri spoke earlier about about the plants going through this museum um, you see uh, a little um, wall that says how 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 ancient egypt um, harvested water and used water from Jordan, for example, I, you know, I have a lot of experience in Petra. And the Nabataeans were able to have a vibrant society, a vibrant community, agriculture, uh, in a very arid desert. How did they do that? Um, they did that by harvesting water. They were expert water engineers. And so that technology still exists and can bring to the table very practical ways in which we can think about our use of water, water harvesting, um, as we think about water shortages and, and um, extreme um, pheno climate phenomena. Um, culture enables us to have, to send our message, please let me know if I go over my four minutes. Culture enables us to, to send our messages on a much wider platform to a much wider audience. We can, you know, museums, artists, film, uh, all sorts of, of media are available to us in the culture sector in which we can actually um, spread awareness and, and really have a much broader outreach for these messages. Um, and then, I, you know, ultimately, culture truly builds more resilient communities. So when we talk about climate action, we need to ensure that, that communities, that people, are able to adapt, are able to survive, and are able to thrive in spite of the challenges that we are all facing because of climate change. And this is where culture can be very, very powerful. Culture enables communities to come together. Um, there are social safety nets that, that um, have existed throughout history that protect people from, um, you know, protect vulnerable communities from, from the very disruptive outcomes of, of global climate change and the very difficult transformations that we need through climate action. So this, in a nutshell, I think, is, is, is how culture can really be an effective um, component to global climate action. Thank you, Princess Dana. And um, Princess Dana, in her own voice, and the Petra National Trust have been leaders in in making these points, but um, uh, they're in good company, it seems, in Jordan, because we increasingly see the government, the, nas the nation of Jordan, being a leader on this topic, and uh, uh, emblematic of that is the fact that King Abdullah of Jordan used his remarks at the World Leader Summit to talk about cultural heritage. I think the, I could be wrong, I think the only world leader who did that. Um, so remarkable. Uh, we. We're used to being in the trenches and the streets in the culture world, but um, we don't mind having the support of national governments too, and thank you to Jordan. So uh, I'm, I hope I'm not breaching protocol. I'm gonna continue in the order that the panelists are seated and next introduce Dr. Osama uh, Abdelmagud. Uh, ah, sorry. Um, it, he is a museum consultant, a lecturer, and the executive director of the Children's Center for Civilization and Great Children's Museum. In Cairo, he's also a leader in the museum movement and the chair of the Egypt Committee of the International Council of Museums, ICOM, um, who's been a fantastic partner with us. ICOM, you'll hear from the international president of ICOM, uh, Amanardi, uh, presently. So, Dr. Abdel Magud, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, Andrew, to, uh, to answer your question about the culture interaction with the climate change and how the culture was neglected for the similar meeting of uh, ICOM climate forums. Please, uh, maybe this better? Okay, uh, one of the uh, main reason of the failure, as uh, Mr. Guthrie said about, uh, is neglection of the culture section to be a part of the climate. Uh, the solution is how the uh, culture pillars to work together deeply with the communities rather than 
to work uh, with the top of the pyramids. That's been culture only for the elites, but the culture is used to be for the uh, communities itself. Uh, I'm speak about the museum, one of the culture pillar, uh, and work uh, together with other pillars. Uh, now today we are in gathering in, in a museum that shows that how of the power of the museum. This was uh, our slogan for the last meeting of ICOM General Conference in Prague last August to show how the uh, the power of the museum and the museum power can work to uh, make a transport of, uh, activities dealing with all issues relating with current issue in the world. Uh, in in particular with the climate change, we have already our uh, scientific uh, uh, committee dealing with sustainability and mainly are working with the climate and the climate action. Today, the museums can play a great role in advocating for the climate change and the reason for the show that uh, the, 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 to answer the question of the museum, how museum can help people to develop their understanding of what climate change means to them, and how can a museum help to facilitate response to climate challenge. Uh, the big task of museum sector, and ICOM Egypt is working closely with, uh, with the Egyptian museum sector as an or affiliated institution together in mostly, uh, most of programs. Uh, the museum sector is not only to inform the public on the science of climate change, but also to equip citizens with the tactical knowledge that enables participation in actions and debates on the climate change that affects their futures. Museums and the Science Center can engage a future-oriented forward thinking frame as places to think the past, to link the past to the far future through a projection of what might happen as place to offer practical governance option and as places to present long-term temporal trajectories, they offer an anti-idiot uh, uh, to short-term thinking and the failure of government to act by presenting the variable disposition ideologies and governance option, therapy, constructing, and mediate view of the future as a series of creative pathways. Uh, notwithstanding the wide potential of museums to contribute meaningfully to addressing the challenges of climate change, it has noted that for the most part, museums have been slow to incorporate, incorporate uh, climate change into their work, risking their own long-term relevance, rather than direct their attention to protecting material from the past museums can direct their work, uh, the full rank of their work, including collecting and public-facing work, towards supporting and enabling better, better futures more actively. Natural History Museum and the Science Center could uh, readily engage around the contemporary issues such as climate change and other environmental topics, as could may, uh, mainly other kind of museum, to become natural fishers, museum like here in the Museum of Sharm el-Sheikh, military museum could focus on topics around the causes and the consequences of contemporary wars in the order to reduce future conflicts. And the ethnography museum could emphasize issues around the culture diversity and identity in the face of globalization and the social inequality. This approach recognizes the in interconnectedness of different forms of heritage, material, natural, culture, and intangible, and connects with emerging ideas of heritage as a future-making practice. Heritage is not a passive, a passive process of simply preserving things from the past that we choose to hold up as a mirror to the present, associated with the particular set of values that we wish to take with us into the future, thinking of the heritage as a creative engagement with the past in the present focuses our attention on our ability to take an active and informed role in the production of our own uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Th th thank you, Dr. McGuade, and I, I appreciate 
you you're really fleshing out this idea of how culture and cultural institutions can help people imagine what a climate resilient future might look like. It, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Farhana Yamin, and it's Farhana. It's it's it doesn't feel quite auspicious enough the way I'm uh, now coming to you on the program because. Farhana has really been existential to the idea of this assembly today, um, more broadly to Culture Cop, and more broadly to centering culture and climate action. And so it's it's um, well and fitting that now um, we can uh, give the microphone to her. Farhana is, like myself, a lawyer. Uh, she used her legal skills auspiciously uh, at the center of climate negotiation. She was there in Paris with the drafting of the Paris Agreement, and so has seen the, as we say in the United States, the sausage making, the lawmaking process up close. But, and I'm quoting here, uh, quoting her here now, uh, at some point became frustrated with the idea that uh, kind of lawyering and uh, policy making alone was going to solve the climate crisis, and took her uh, skills to the streets to focus on, uh, to quote her, more radical, um, nonviolent action. Uh, to confront the climate crisis, becoming the head of strategy for Extinction um, Rebellion. But uh, Farhana wasn't only uh, in the uh, only working on strategy behind the scenes. She was also at the barricades, um, famously and uh, gluing herself to Shell Oil's London offices, and more recently using her voice and her position to challenge uh, U.S. climate envoy John Kerry on his inaction on loss and damage. And so uh, Farhana has really been um, a, a global force and a global voice, and uh, her presence uh, in the culture arena is, is the consequence of that cannot be understated. She's currently the creative di director and coordinator of the Culture Cop, as well as the co-director of the Climate Justice and Just Transition Donor Collaborative. And so Farhana, we would not be here without you, and um, it's really an honor and my pleasure to give you the microphone. Well, um, I just want to know if the mic is working because I know there's been some problems. Uh, is it working? Good, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can I make it louder? Is that louder? Okay. I think we have to hold it right here for other speakers and myself. Um, to Andrew, all of the Climate Heritage Network, to Alison, who, uh, whose board I sit on at Julie's Bicycle, to all of the colleagues here from Culture Cop, many of you are in the audience. Sophie, Sophie Schnapp, who has just left, who is the uh, other coordinator. And we are so thrilled to be here uh, and so thrilled that so many of the Egyptian colleagues are here. We are not here just for today. We are here to build relationships that last. And, you know, this is Egypt where we're building and your culture has informed and is lasting and is studied all over the world. Every child you know, does a class on, on the history of Egypt uh, and many of our myths, our stories, your culture is embedded uh, in, in our hearts and minds everywhere. So I really want to, to say that because sometimes I'm hearing a lot of frustrations about people arriving in Sham and leaving Sham and Sham being, you know, charming as it is, uh, uh, just a one-stop shop for the next few days where we run around. And I wanted really, as one of the core pillars of what we're doing, um, to make sure that we have very, very, very deep, trusted relationships of all those who are like-minded, all those who are maybe slightly on the fence and not as convinced that culture has an important part to play. Actually, I think we're all friends here. But we need to convince others that actually diplomacy on its own uh, politics on its own, that science on its own, that siloed policy making on its own is not going to be enough. And that's actually my story. I'm now more, I would say I was more a policy storyteller. So going back to Andrew, your challenge and your question to us, it wasn't just the Secretary General saying we have failed and we are failing. It was the assessment of about eight major reports looking at a range of metrics about progress in the last 30 years, uh, saying we are so far away. Uh, and that is a damning indictment on our 
our negotiations process, on our political process, our economic pro uh, processes, our financial systems. And I think this is the insight that has, has, has made my trajectory very different in the last, ten, in the last five years. Um, I guess at COP1, which was in 1995, where I just had a baby, uh, my first child was 28, who's 28 now, um, we, we understood the climate problem as mainly a problem about bad gases and one that was in the future. So we were going to control these gases just like we controlled other pollutants. This was the mindset that actually we, we may need some uh, levers like taxes, carbon taxes. We may need some new instruments like some carbon markets and offsets to give some flexibility. We would ed basically use voluntary measures and these um, market-based mechanisms, as we came to call them, and we would, we would deal with these gases. And to cut a long story short, the 30 years from then to now almost, we've learned this is not just about gases. This is a problem uh, which is about changing our entire system, changing society as a whole. And it is even more than that. It is a paradigm shift that is needed to do that. And so we are at the process and in the arc of time where actually a paradigm shift is happening where nature, which was uh, 400 years ago when we separated ourselves off and went down the Enlightenment route um, in many parts of the world, where the mainstream culture you know, became one that was essentially about exploiting nature uh, instead of respecting it and living within it and seeing ourselves part of it. That paradigm we now know is toxic and bad and is killing us and it's killing the planet. And that paradigm shift is necessary and uh, uh, the urgency is you know, uh, upon us. Um, and the paradigm shift cannot happen with a bunch of diplomats and some heads of state, right? They cannot do anything. They cannot say anything. They can say and inspire that shift to happen. But it must come from within us. It must come from a new set of values, from a new way of thinking. In some cases, it's a, it's a new way of thinking that is based on some very old uh, wisdoms, on some very old inherited w wisdoms from all of the indigenous people who have been safeguarding and defending uh, the, the land, defending nature, defending forests, keeping the concepts that are about ecological balance, about ma'at, as I understand it, you have a word too. Many of those cultures retain that knowledge, that wisdom that we in many parts of the world and certainly mainstream culture lost. And I think we are here at this COP. Uh, why did we try and have culture COP here? Because the, the COP has become an enormous site of resistance and trying to reform a massive set of interconnected systems. This is why annually all the leaders and the ministers are turning up here not just in the old days at COP1 when we had environment ministers coming for a day, maybe. Now we have heads of state coming more or less every year. You know, 90 of them came this year. We have ministers who are due to arrive for the second half of this week. The leaders have left, and now their ministers will arrive. We're in this funny gap in the middle where the negotiators are meant to do something. So I think the response that we, who are now working in the cultural space, in the space where we know we must change people's hearts, change their way of thinking, change their way of relating to each other, change their way of relating to nature, must happen with and the support of the art, cultural, heritage network. And many of whom, frankly, are also working within a very old set of paradigms. So we need disruptive uh, voices and influences within to change things. We need museums to work in a different way. This is a stunning, you know, an amazing place. I can't wait for a break so that I can I can visit uh, properly, and we'll try and come back when I have a have a moment. But all of us need to question, for example, the museums where I live in the UK. Where is all that stuff from? Why was it acquired? What do we do with it now? The art galleries, who are whose work are they featuring? And this fundamental shift this paradigm shift that I'm speaking of, I think will come about if we change who is at the table and who's recognized 
as the owner of knowledge, as the owner of rights, as the owner of something that must be respected. In the past, many cultures were deemed inferior or backward or a hindering process. And that is reflected in the way in which now the new voices are coming back, whether it's young people, whether it's indigenous people, whether it's uh, wisdom keepers from all around our lands, whether it's the global south itself, powerful though it is in some terms, has been marginalized and has been kept out of negotiations. We saw, saw that last year at the COP on the final day of COP26, the entire developing world, you know, the vast majority of the world's population, the vast majority of the world's countries, uh, agreed on a loss and damage facility. They had inserted that, it was in the text, and it came out because a handful of countries insisted that that be removed. And that is the battle that is going on here. Still, those voices, the colonized countries, frankly, lost in, in COP26. So they're here, I think, to try and make good in the face of now enormous, enormous consequences unfolding for millions of people, including the country that I come from, Pakistan, as many of you know, has had the most severe floods that are still uh, having a massive impact. They may have lost coverage in the news, but they are having a massive impact. So turning um, to finally, you know, I, I know over my time, uh, but I, I think we here uh, as Culture Pop are trying to build as many alliances to create ever bigger tents, ever bigger coalitions, ever bigger ways to support all those who are trying to challenge uh, the, both the harmful practices in the arts and culture space that must be relinquished, powers that must be let go, as well as imagine and create a very different future based on uh, the equality of all and based on you know the sovereignty of nature as opposed to the sovereignty of nature state, national state. Um, and I would like to invite you to um, maybe, when you have a minute, look under your seat, you'll find some cards, uh, and they are uh, a way, a very gentle way of introducing you to the work of Culture Pop. It isn't really an organization. It's a set of ideas designed to catalyze everyone creating spaces where people, voices, nature can move in harmony and together, and where we can all imagine and actually then carry out uh, uh, those visions for a new future. So I invite you all to, to, to have a look at them. You'll be introduced to them a bit later on as well. And I think I'll uh, end there. I will carry on rebelling. I think all of us need to rebel against the way of life that is actually we know is destroying the planet, that is destroying our own children's future. And that is what has given me courage, you know, knowing that um, I have four children, <laughs> that they will, they will look very poorly on us our track record if we do not do more and we must do better than just have conferences where we talk but do not in the end move with our heart and integrity and with the new vision that we need to uh, make real genuine and new progress uh, possible so thank you thank you for giving me the floor and inviting me thank you for hannah our next speaker was introduced to me as Sunshine Dunstan Moore, but Sunshine, I understand that Sunshine is really the English translation of your name and your mother tongue. And maybe you can just start by telling the folks what that name is. Thank you, yes. Shem, Squakosh Dunstan Moore. Good morning, my name is Sunshine Dunstan Moore. Squakosh is the Nikuham, name of my name. Thank you, Sunshine. And Sunshine, uh, as you said, comes from the Nakapomak and Yakima First Nation in the lands that we call Canada. She is a community uh, climate justice coordinator and is using her voice on issues of indigenous and human rights. She's also on the youth advisory group of the Canadian UNESCO Commission and was involved in, in the Stockholm Plus 50 process, which was a quite consequential global environmental public health. Sunshine, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Art and Cultural Heritage COP27 and, and to hear your voice. Sunshine. Thank you. Um, also, of which I forgot to add on to there, I'm also on the Environment Climate Change Youth Council. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm on the Environment Climate Change Youth Council, the federal uh, 
uh, Youth Council Under Minister Gabol. Uh, so I was really excited to come and speak to you today. And culture is intertwined in every intersection of climate action. How I see it, culture is essentially the DNA of climate action. We don't see it, but we can't live without it. We cannot have sustainable climate action without acknowledging and amplifying our cultures. The world is filled with many beautiful teachings. All these teachings are a solution to the climate crisis. The history of Indigenous people in Canada is a painful one. I'm a first and second generation survivor of residential school. From the intergenerational trauma my father and grandparents have experienced, my upbringing was more on the instinct to survive. And from this, I was not raised in my traditional ways. There is still a disconnect to my culture within myself and my family. Just as there's intergenerational trauma, there is love hope, strength, and resilience. Going back to culture being the DNA of climate action, Indigenous people have been connected to the land since time immemorial. Our languages are very land-based because of that connection. Though I may not feel the connection to my culture, it is in my DNA as an Indigenous person, and I see it all the time in little ways. I can tell if it's going to be a hot day by watching the sunrise, I can tell if it's going to rain or just be overcast by looking at the clouds. I wasn't inherently taught these things, but that intergenerational knowledge is intertwined in my DNA. When you look closely at the fundamentals, the core of climate action, it is indigenous ways of knowing and teachings. Contemporary climate action is failing us because of that lack of connection to the land but that is really only on a larger national and international level. Because when you look at the grassroots, when you look at local communities and the work they are doing, it is tackling and supporting so many different projects to fight the climate crisis. Something I've witnessed working in these international climate spaces, the grown-ups in the room who speak about the climate crisis and climate change talk about it, they realize that they start to hear about in their 30s and 40s. But when you speak to elders, they and their grandparents have been seen observing and noticing the changes of our lands. Indigenous people have been advocating for the land before we even started using the words climate crisis, climate change, or climate action. Our elders and ancestors have been defending our planet since time immemorial. What is missing from climate action and making it fail on a larger scale is that disconnect to our land. And that is exactly why we need to start amplifying the voices of indigenous peoples and indigenous youth because the solutions are literally intertwined in our DNA. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Sunshine. I, I think... Um, I might do is um, see if there are any questions from the audience uh, for our panel. You all have been sitting there quite respectfully, and maybe I can uh, give the mic to some of you if you'd like to uh, pose a question to the panel. And I'll do that for maybe two minutes, and then we can close with a round of statements from the uh, panelists where I will ask them to uh, each share a thought about a concrete step or, or steps that we can take going forward to better realize the power of culture to help get us back on track in tackling this climate crisis. But uh, let me, uh, for the moment, a few interventions on the floor, and I see a hand here and a hand there. Hi, my name is Johanna Suleta. I am UK-based, and I was wondering how can people connect more with uh, these uh, global cultural initiatives that you are doing through the COP. Uh, for me, it was just quite niche that I found out because of my friends, but I know many more people would like to uh, globally engage. So I wonder if there's a, a platform for it or how can uh, more people be added to it globally? Thank you very much. Yeah, so how do we grow the movement? I, 
think um, my participation came as a result, actually, in 2018 in Extinction Rebellion, which was one of the new movements, uh, along with like uh, the school strikers and what became Fridays for Future, many others. And one of the people who is here called Ruth, uh, she's somewhere sitting over there, um, she suggested, why don't cultural organizations and artists declare emergency? And this was in response to the political kind of initiatives that we were taking that let, let's get governments to declare emergency, cities to declare a climate emergency. And that is why I'm here. And those initiatives are taking root all over the world, actually. So culture declares emergency is a template, is a model. Others can start working on it. Uh, and I think that um, we're now so far ahead, nearly every city, every council and the whole most countries in the population have done that. Um, I think we have a better job to do. Many of us have only met here for the first time and are realizing the amazing work that we're all doing. And so I think building the kind of infrastructure of sharing information, letting people know what's going on, just the simple ways in which we do that uh, is something that is slightly boring, but we all need to figure that out and help everyone do that. And I think... Um, as I, as I keep saying to everyone, add the word activist to your CV. So if you're a singer, you're an artist, you're a curator, you're someone, you know, try and do something different. Um, and there's many resources. I give a little plug to Julie's Bicycle, who just put out a, a wonderful resource for the art sector about climate justice. What does the art sector do in response to climate justice? So there are just some ways, but that's a fantastic question and a prompt for all of us here to connect with each other and carry on doing that. So, Shanka and I, just, maybe just to carry the question forward, um, you know, you, so you, you, your peers, your colleagues are climate activists, they're working with people in the climate justice uh, and human rights space. For them, is culture top of mind or are you sort of uh, always having to bring it up because it's missing? And, and also, do you find cultural institutions, libraries, museums, government culture bodies, are they there in the trenches with you? Are they helping you? Or could they be doing more? How, how, how do we connect up culture and what you're doing? Yeah. So I guess this is really speaking on more of a youth part. Um, within the spaces I work, we're all relatively under 30. And within the indigenous spaces I work, it is a very safe um, cultivating space where we can really talk about anything so we do talk about culture all the time it is integrated in everything we do and we try to ensure that we there's inclusivity uh, diversity and we really want to create safe spaces for not just indigenous youth but for non-indigenous youth within canada um, we're only in within the canadian context right now um, and speaking of on like museums and I studied art history, I, I love museums. Um, so it's really exciting for me to be on the federal level now where it's, it's starting to become more of a conversation, uh, especially within the youth council that I'm at. Um, we're such a diverse group and we are able to bring our lived experiences and really start bringing in different aspects of the, the climate crisis into the federal government where we can talk about culture and languages um, on top of science and policy. Yeah, thank you. So if I'm hearing you correctly, in, in your space with your colleagues, culture is uh, in their minds. The cultural dimensions of climate are relevant. And so if it's missing, it must go missing as we go up into the siloization of environment and culture and pilot and somewhere uh, beyond the trenches, the front lines, is where it's uh, then thinning out, it seems like you're saying. Yep, and we, we're, we keep pushing it. We yeah. keep bringing it up. Yeah. We keep challenging. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Osama, do you want to speak to this? Um, yeah, yeah I, from the museum section and museum perspective, in this issue to finalize what we reached in the uh, offer the Green Museum Initiative. And this initiative has been implemented on the rail. Today will be signed 
dealing to five museums will be turned into green museums. But uh, this initiative was dealing with the museums that integrate the design where they depend on sustainable design, the use of environmentally friendly building material, and uh, the realize, uh, reliance on resources, sustainable energy, in the generation of the electricity used heating and cooling, reducing the waste and the air pollution, and using uh, reusable material and recycling, and uh, in managing its various groups of actives. The second uh, uh, step uh, was uh, uh, <coughs> to establish a sustainable uh, development unit in and uh, a green team in each museum to the museum's carbon footprint on the environment annually to follow up on museums uh, performance toward the green to monitor the challenges and the problems that may be prevent transition to green and work to solve them step by step and really thank you yeah, so so powerful when cultural institutions use their voice to model and and uh, communicate about these issues uh i saw another a hand over here um Thank you to all of the panel. This has been really, um, really interesting. I'm um, speaking from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Um, we're really focused at COP this week and next week at the international level, but many cultural actors and institutions require at local level or city level um, sub subnational government funding in order to um, carry out this work and carry out their mission to their um, users. So I wonder, um, is there, uh, from, from our perspective, we can engage our members, our, our members in, um, in, in advocacy to institutional decision makers to, you, to create a larger platform for this work within their library spaces. But is there more that we could do to help um, reach out to policymakers at a subnational level and, and, and ask them to invest in heritage and the arts role in, in setting these new narratives and um, the importance that has for climate action. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Prefiguring pre a little bit, a conversation we'll have later in the day, but I, I you know, there's, what, I what is it, Claire? Hundreds of thousands of libraries uh, in the world. And it, Imagine if every one of them was a hub of climate action. What what can cultural centers, cultural institutions do more of to to um, help us tackle climate change? And I will give that to all the panel. I guess I'll tackle this one first. Um, I am from a rural and remote community in Canada, and one of our biggest issues was having. Uh, I'm from a rural community in Lit or in Canada known as Lytton, and one of our biggest issues was not having access to these to resources um, because it's a small community. Um, I think having like digital archives, um, different ways of ensuring remote and rural communities are able to access different resources is very important. Um, as a youth in, in the sector I'm at currently, I, I think that's the best uh, answer I can give you, um, just from some lived experience. I think, um, I, think, I think one of the things is this narrative of not enough money for certain sectors and certain activities. And so I'm you know, com coming from the UK and we have this narrative of austerity and that public funding is very limited and that it certainly isn't being prioritized for for things like libraries and cultural institutions which are which are finding it really difficult uh, and it's not just because of covid it's because of this much longer bigger narrative that has starved uh, funding and has diminished the role of culture whether it's for students to study the arts you know, these are the courses that are cut and devalued. So I think sometimes we need to take on that bigger, the bigger narrative uh, and, you know, do that together. And that's where the transformation and the systemic change is coming from, is to challenge that bigger narrative and to 
work as a coalition, work in alliance, work with communities, work with people, work with politicians to change now this ridiculous idea that there isn't enough money. There is. It's just going to the wrong things. Um, it's just going to the wrong things. <laughs> um, but more practically, what we've been doing in the context of this is trying to create pop-ups and to encourage even the existing institutions to to partner with young people, with their, m the most marginalized communities, to offer them the space that they already have and to make use of it and to make that a self-funded model so that you're continually um, grounded in and using the space which you have, which is a huge asset, to still be of service to those groups who are particularly at the sharp end and let them use their imagination to transform your space. I see that uh, library as museums also, as uh, use the libraries as an arena for advocacy and awareness of the climate change as well. But I will not speak on behalf of the National Archive and uh, the, uh, the National Libraries, but may I speak on behalf of the museum sector about the library within the museums. There is now a, big, a great progress in the libraries within the museum. And it, the library the museum it will be included in green, in green museum initiative as well. Ironic. Um, I think be, because we're behind schedule, we're going to have to wrap up this panel. And, I, and luckily, we'll have our uh, presenters with us uh, um, now and then. Princess Diana will rejoin us in the, in the afternoon. And so you can continue this conversation with them. But I'm going to wrap up this panel by just asking each of the panelists if they would take one or two minutes to um, look to the future. And uh, we've, we've talked about the criticalness of centering culture and climate change. We've talked about even in the questions brought up some of the challenges and the needs. So what is a top of mind strategy? What is the low hanging fruit, to use an English uh, idiom? Uh, what should we do, what's the next thing we should do to scale up culture-based climate action? Uh, Sunshine, can I ask you to start? Yes. Um, for me, I think it's really supporting youth and youth-led initiatives. Um, youth face many barriers when it comes to creating different projects, especially when it comes to funding. Um, creating safe spaces for them to continue doing this work. Climate policy is not a safe space for youth right now, and it hasn't been. And I've been working it now for 10 months, and it's it's brutal. It is brutal for youth right now. And I, I guess just one last thing, there needs to be a change in the communications of climate. Um, as the started failure, uh, I don't agree with that. I do not agree with using the doomism communications within climate. And we need a shift there. It start, needs to start being more positive because there is a ton of work being done from the ground level and even a ton of work being done now by youth in the international level. And it is very disheartening to hear that our work is being undermined by this shift, this narrative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we know, a, we, we hear a lot about what, what the future is going to look like. We need to travel less. We need to eat less meat. We need to do this and that. But what is a positive vision of a post-carbon, just climate resilient future? And it's apparently quite difficult to imagine what that is. And who are the imagination people? <laughs> Culture. Um, so that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Farhana. Um, look, I've been in this international set of spaces for a very long time. And uh, a couple of years ago, I decided that I would divide my, my at least work uh, life into a third, into thirds. So only a third of it would be on the international COP process. A third of it would be on creativity and the cultural sector. And a third of it would be on community. And I said, community is the new COP. We all everywhere have to do all of the ecological uh, actions, not just to save climate, but also, as I said, integrate, respect the nature back into our lives. And that means that every village, every high street, every library, every cultural institution, every institution has to do something different and change. Um, so to me, that's one of the biggest, more practical shifts is 
you know, creating this sort of mycelium upwards to support what we were doing because it was not enough. And, you know, for me, the treaties, three treaties of, to help negotiate over three decades are, are not rooted in reality. We've got legislation which is also not rooted enough, which is why it's very vulnerable to elections and changes because we now need to root it in practices and in people and make sure that all of these concepts like just transition, climate justice, the circular economy, regenerative practices actually make sense in everyday life and to everyday people and to our everyday reality. This, this isn't real. This is nothing to meet, meet to your point, meeting to your family, meeting to come to. So the rest of our lives are our, you know, spent as as in this, as mothers, as, as workers, as uh, families, and that's where the real change is happening. And I think that's, that is a very different and a more joyful decision. I totally understand and agree that the way communities have resisted, um, resisted you know, violence and suppression has always been joyful. They haven't all been miserable. So, you know, I think just creating that community of resistance is a joyful act. Brings a sense of achievement, and I think it also brings in the very values that we need, which is of kindness and of compassion and of rest, and not running around like crazy as many of us are doing here, but having a, a, a stillness and a center which is grounded. Uh, and I think Dreamy said, you know, ground yourself in her, ground yourself in your family, ground yourself in friendships because they will sustain you, uh, and you'll have fun. And not to get you know, too depressed every time there is use of um, you know these horrific new climate extremes that are happening, but to reach out in solidarity. Nature may become unkinder to us, but we don't have to become unkinder to each other. We have to increase our own responses in them. So I think that's where the big shifts are. Yeah, I will not add so more, but I will. I see that if the uh, culture sector to found a footprint in this issue, most or all uh, culture pillars they have to work together in in a harmony, not as a, as a, as a separate islands. Uh, and how to use the creativity of the culture uh, as a symbol of the community change their uh, mentality about the climate change and how the, the, the culture uh, governance and the culture sector to learn from the community itself uh, about their daily use and their use of the materials and how they survived for so thousands of years with the materials they used with no harm for the climate and how to learn from the uh, our history and their ecology, from what's so-called the historical ecology, and the, how the ecology was come to us for, from thousand of years till the two two hundred years in a little bit sustained, but how the damage has been having in the last two hundred years? What the the our ancestors used the material they used and how they survive and help the 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 climate to come to us after thousand of years in a good condition and what we did to harm it for the last only two centuries. We have to learn from each other. We have to work together in harmony. Each sector of culture, they have we have to find an initiative to work together, all of sectors. But now most of sectors are work, are working in separate islands. But now we have to find a way if we would like to find our self footprint in this issue, we have to work together and uh, I think the culture uh, sector is really important sector and important print in in the section of uh, of uh, the climate change. The climate change as uh, leadership will not succeed if the culture will transform and push, move and move uh, the move forward all the sectors behind. And we'll find a lot of solutions for our change for the future by the support of the culture sector. Thank you.